All right, just a quick recap, uh, getting started just about a minute early here. Um, my name's Ian Taylor, and I'm a director here at Flojo. Uh, my email address is listed there, taylor at flojo.com. Feel free to reach out. Um, again, this webinar is gonna be recorded and placed onto Flojo University along with this slide deck, so if you need to refer to it later, it should be available there. And today we're talking about combining your single cell RNA sequencing analysis with your flow analysis. If you've done single cell RNA uh, sequencing before, you've probably done uh, flow sorting in order to get the cells of interest for sequencing. And there's no reason why you shouldn't be combining your matrices between expression and the um, surface protein uh, content there. Kill my video here. So just a quick overview of what I'm gonna to cover today. I'm gonna to be working with some lupus data that was provided by the uh, AMP consortium uh, very generously. And that data did contain both flow uh, FCS files and an expression matrix saved as a CSV file. Um, using a little bit of magic in R uh, programming and some metadata that mapped the plate ID and well ID of each flow uh, sample to the expression matrix of um, cell IDs, we're able to create a gigantic uh, data file that contains both the flow parameters there and the expression matrix itself for the RNA uh, gene parameters or RNA expression values. Um, the data itself when loaded into SeekGeek looks like the following. Um, and this is actually demo data. If you download SeekGeek and get a trial, um, you'll have access to this uh, AMP SLE merged data file, which contains about 7,000 cells, 30,000 gene parameters, and 17 flow parameters. Now, six of those are uh, scatter parameters, so there's actually uh, 11 proteins recorded in those flow parameters, uh, protein expression, I should say. The data itself uh, is a human kidney model. Uh, again, flow sorted, where we did, uh, or the, the collaborators did single cell RNA sequencing on it, and then we were able to merge those two pieces of information. <clears throat> Once you've loaded the data into SeekGeek, probably one of the first things you're gonna, gonna wanna do is perform some quality control. And so we've provided a quality control button that opens a quality control platform in the form of two graph windows. Uh, these graph windows show some new parameters that aren't otherwise available, and they're usually used for quality control. So those are the metrics that we're going to utilize here. You also get some new derived observations within a gene view window, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what gene view is in a moment, because uh, for those of you who have used Flojo, gene view is going to be one of the newest concepts in SeekGeek. Um, I should also mention that we have this workspace, which is very similar uh, to the Flojo workspace with one major exception. Um, we have a uh, gene set area at the top of the workspace where we can see that any uh, gene set we gate on becomes a new uh, node there. In this case, quality genes contains 12,000 um, features. Now these quality control gates that I've drawn here are meant to remove doublets and outlier genes that we don't want to use for further downstream clustering, uh, at least not immediately. All right. Another thing uh, unique to the single cell RNA sequencing world is um, knee plots, which are often used for quality control. However, when importing an expression matrix into SeekGeek, oftentimes this knee calling will have already been performed. And in that case, you'll see a graph like this when you're confirming the knee calling which is essentially just your quality cells. It's like a plateau within the data set. If you were looking at a, uh, a rank of genes expressed per cell in a log log plot, um, if this had not had knee calling performed, um, we would see a drop off in events here in uh, gene expression per cell. And then uh, it would flatten out again. Those would represent our dead and dying cells. And then further on, it would um, drop again and flatten out where we would see some debris. But in this case, as in most, the expression matrix has already been filtered for quality um, live cells. So we probably don't need to do any adjustment there at this time. The other uh, 
type of quality control filtering that we get uh, asked a lot in support is on mitochondrial uh, expressors. And basically, uh, people want to remove those gene, uh, those uh, cells, excuse me, that are expressing mitochondrial genes at a high level relative to the rest of the genes. Um, and we can actually do that in SeekGeek. The way to do it is uh, first create a set of gene sets, one for mitochondrial genes, where you can see I'm just filtering for any gene that has MT dash, which is a handy way to uh, denote mitochondrial genes. And I'm creating a new gene set out of it. That's going to appear at the top of the workspace. It's also going to become a parameter that I can gate on independently uh, in order to remove those, gene, those cells that are expressing mitochondrial genes to a high degree. I can also create a gene set for all of the rest of the genes, basically just using some Boolean logic to remove these mitochondrial genes. And then we can create like a, uh, a ratio gate that just removes anything that's high in mitochondrial expression relative to um, the rest of its expression which looks like this. So you can see on the y-axis, I have my quality genes minus the mitochondrial genes. And on the x-axis, I have just the mitochondrial genes. So I'm gating on you know, uh, low mitochondrial expression relative to the rest of my genes, and thereby removing any cells that might be dead or, or dying. Um, just another way to perform quality control in single cell RNA expression matrices. Next, again, kind of just to illustrate that it's possible to use your flow parameters in SeekGeek. Uh, I'm just gating on our normal size gates and gating out singlet events, um, just the way that you would in Flojo or in a flow experiment. Now we want to go on and um, do some clustering. Um, this is because we have so many different parameters in this data set, more than 30,000. Um, we need to take some unbiased way of clustering out the different um, populations available there. And so uh, first I want to show that there are plugins available in SeekGeek, two of which can be used for clustering, Monocle and Surat. I'm going to be focusing on the very popular Surat pipeline um, in the next couple of slides. Uh, all of the plugins here are available at exchange.flojo.com. Um, so I would encourage you to check those out. If you do end up using the exchange.flojo.com plugins, they come with some documentation that will help you with setup. Um, that's important because some of these, uh, and these are two good examples, rely on dependencies in R that do require a little bit of, um, a little bit of setup. If you have any questions on that, feel free to write to me, uh, taylor at flojo.com, and I'll be happy to walk you through the, the process there. When you first open up Surat, you're going to see this interface where we can uh, set some different quality control filters. Um, we can set up the normalization that we're performing. By default, it will be the negative binomial. Uh, we can also choose the set of genes that we want to run the Surat clustering on. Um, and it's going to develop dimensionality reduction parameters for TSNE X and TSNE Y, as well as um, performing clustering based on a, a graph-based k-nearest neighbors clustering algorithm. Once we've run Surat, we're going to get the following kind of outputs. Um, so on the left, this is just a static plot generated by R, but it's importable into um, SeekGeek simply by dragging and dropping the Surat node into the layout editor. And it's showing us relative um, coverage of the, the genes for each cluster that was developed. And then on the right, we're seeing uh, the TSNE mapping that was developed out of the Surat pipeline overlaid with the different clusters that were produced. And these are just populations within the workspace. If you're used to a flow experiment um, in Flojo, they're going to appear in the same way. And we can create an overlay just like you would in Flojo. So that shows us um, some clustering, un totally unbiased. Uh, I'm not sure it's the best that we can do, however. And there is a TSNE. Uh, option to run natively within SeekGeek. And when I ran that, it looked a little bit nicer. We're getting some cleaner clusters here. However, when I overlay with the Surat clusters, they're in good agreement. So that's um, a comforting thing to see. Um, and so this is just another dimensionality reduction, again, performing TSNE natively within SeekGeek. All right, so next, uh, obviously what we want to know is wh which cluster is what? What are the different cells that we've now um, produced mapping for? And since we have protein information from the flow parameters, why not use that to um, dig deeper into the data? 
The really obvious way of using our flow parameters is just doing canonical gating. So here we can see that uh, CD3 versus CD19 will pull out our B cells and our T cells. And if we dig deeper into T cells, we can do normal hierarchical gating wherein we can look at our killer T cells or cytotoxic T cells and our helper T cells here, um, just as an example. But um, there may be an easier way uh, in this case, especially since we have such, um, well, we have 11 uh, fluorescent uh, channels we can actually just use multigraph color mapping, which is a new feature in SeatGeek um, on our flow parameters in order to see which clusters are lighting up for which markers. Um, in order to run that, you're just gonna right click on the plot of interest. Uh, in this case, our whole TSNE um, map. Choose make multigraph overlay and select multigraph color mapping there. That's gonna bring up the following prompt on the right, which is gonna allow you to select the gene set and or genes that you want to run this on. And in this case, I want to run uh, all of the different fluorescent flow parameters. So these are our different antibodies that were um, created in the, uh, in the merge at the very beginning of this talk. Once I click OK, it's going to go ahead and color map this TSNE plot by each of these flow parameters. And we get this really satisfying and beautiful I think, um, illustration of what TSNE is mapping. So for example, right in the middle here, we see our B cells are popping out really nicely. Uh, if we look for CD3, we can see this is our T, uh, T cell cluster. And within T cells, we have our you know, cytotoxic T cells and we have our, um, let's see, my window's in the way. And we have our helper T cells here. We also probably are looking at uh, epithelial cells here, CD45 negative. Um, and our monocytes here. So um, we can begin to do some cell calling just based on this color mapping of flow parameters. Now, um, if you only had the single cell RNA sequencing expression matrix, this would become much more difficult. We would need to do something like uh, gene set enrichment analysis or look at um, various different gene sets that define our phenotypes. Um, it would become a, a much less trivial process. But since we have those flow parameters, this is made um, actually really, really simple. So here's what we get in terms of cell calling. Um, and of course, um, this TSNE map is run on um, data that's been normalized. <clears throat> Next, what we might wanna do is look at the expression matrix. So far, we've been a little bit focused on the uh, proteins that are available. But obviously, since we have the single cell RNA sequencing analysis, we should be looking at more of the, um, the, the genes that are available in, that, in those data sets as well. So in order to begin differential expression analysis, we wanna make a comparison. Um, you're always gonna be comparing between two populations in order to do differential expression. Um, and in this case, I'm comparing those B cell, those cells that are not in the B cell population with those that are B cells. So this is essentially a comparison of B cells versus everything else. Um, and I know that in this X axis, because the B cell population has a minus sign here, which means uh, a Boolean not gate has been applied to the B cells population. Looking at that same plot in a graph window, it's gonna look like this. <clears throat> Again, not B cells versus B cells. And if we wanna create a uh, comparison between these two on statistical uh, parameters, we're gonna open up what we call the volcano plot, or what is the volcano plot, by clicking on what we're calling the differential gene expression button here at the top of the graph window. As an example of what the volcano plot looks like, um, it's something like this. This is not actually our B cells volcano plot, um, but just for illustration purposes, you're going to get a fold change parameter or statistic on the x-axis and a, an adjusted p-value or q-value on the y-axis. Now, this q-value is um, developed by performing first a Mann-Whitney U test to get the p-values and, and then applying a Bonferroni correction on them, which is uh, an appropriate statistic uh, operation to perform for single cell RNA sequencing analyses. Uh, comparison between populations. Obviously in the fold change area, we know that anything that's positive would be considered upregulated in our comparison, and anything in the negative range would be considered downregulated down for our uh, test versus the control comparison. 
And then the p-value, of course, indicates significance, where the highest significance gets the lowest p-value. We generally set a cutoff at around 0 0.05 adjusted p-value. So to show you what that actually looks like for B cells, here are our upregulated genes, and we got 603 of them. And here are our downregulated genes. Um, we got 85 of those. Now you'll notice I have adjusted the p-value here for the different gene sets. That's simply because I want a reasonable number of genes to comb through uh, in downstream analysis. But you might consider setting your uh, p-value threshold here at 0 0.05, which is nicely indicated by a dotted line, um, or you can adjust it to whatever geometry or location um, you think would suit your data. So we leave that kind of open to the researcher. Um, and this is only showing up and down regulated genes with regard to B cells. We could dig into any of our uh, further subtypes um, or our, our different phenotypes uh, going forward, but because this is just an example, I'm gonna stick to the B cells for now. Uh, also, in the workspace, we double click on the gene sets themselves. We get these gene set inspector windows that show us which parameters were included in that volcano plot gating. And we see the first couple of parameters are actually our flow parameters. Obviously, they are going to be differentially expressed um, relative to each of the comparators. But we also have a list of different genes that we could begin investigating. Um, these could be therapeutic targets, these could be um, just genes of interest. Um, in various ways for your analysis. But what do we do with those genes? Um, aside from, you know, potentially publishing a list of different genes that are important, we could do uh, a heat map. I'm not going to show that here. Um, we could also do gene set enrichment analysis. Now, in order to uh, go forward with that, we're going to need a gene set library. Um, in our gene set enrichment analysis, we actually utilize uh, Fisher's exact test for those bioinformatics people in the room. Um, and the gene set enrichment analysis is used to infer some biological state uh, based on the matching of one gene set to uh, another gene set in a library, a gene set of interest to a gene set in a library. So what are gene set libraries? Well, they're essentially just collections of gene sets that are stored uh, usually in a gene matrix transpose format, um, essentially a CSV file where the rows are gene sets. Uh, and the first column is the name of each uh, subsequent gene set. You can create your own GMT files within SeekGeek simply by exporting a set of gene sets together. Um, and there are numerous databases available on the web that contain pre-made uh, pre GMT libraries for you if you, if you wanna take a look at those. However, um, we do recommend some caution when curating gene sets, it's important to uh, keep your model organism and tissue type uh, very specific to the gene set that you're looking at. Um, you also want roughly equivalent depth of gene coverage. So if you're looking at, you know, 10,000 genes that describe B cells, then you don't want to look at um, only maybe 10 that describe your T cells if you're doing a comparison at the phenotypical level. Um, I'm actually not going to perform much uh, curation here in this slide. Uh, I'm just going to run the gene set enrichment on all of the gene annotations um, gene set library. So in order to run gene set enrichment, we're just going to right click on the gene set that was found to be upregulated in B cells. And within that right click menu, choose enrichment test. That's going to open up our enrichment analysis platform here, where the gene set that we selected, our test gene set is already listed. We need to select a model. Now the model would ideally be the entire set of genes used for gene calling in sequencing. Uh, however, you can use the raw sample itself, which is what we're utilizing here. You can also select, well, you'll also need to select your gene set library. And in this case, as I mentioned, I'm going to use all of the gene annotations um, GMT file, which is uh, easily down, downloadable. You can also set a p-value cutoff. So this is the p-value for your Fisher's exact test to tell uh, what level of significance match you want to include in the results. And this is the result that I get for B cells. <clears throat> so for uh, somebody studying B cells, each of these different uh, processes may be uh, really important to know. Um, this data set also comes from patients suffering from lupus. So there may be something about these um, processes in the B cells that's important for uh, 
or lupus, maybe like viral gene expression is um, a set of genes that we would want to take a closer look at. It looks like it's matching our B cell upregulated gene set to a significant degree at two to the uh, two times 10 to the negative 57. And um, that's just one possible avenue that you might want to go down when you're doing your analysis in SeekGeek on uh, data merged with uh, flow. So um, if you have further questions or um, want to check out some more resources, we have more webinars available at flowjo.com. We also have documentation for SeekGeek available at this URL, docs.flowjo.com forward slash SeekGeek. Again, the plugins for uh, SeekGeek, which are extremely valuable and add lots of new functionality are available at exchange.flojo.com. If you need tech support, you can always write to SeekGeek at flojo.com. We have an extremely fast response time. Uh, although you can also feel free to write to me. My email is taylor at flojo.com. And we provide free trials of SeekGeek. Uh, if you visit flojo.com, look under the solutions tab for SeekGeek and then click on free trial. It'll give you some instructions on how to sign up for our new uh, Flojo portal website and then to get the trial itself. So um, that's, that's my slide deck for today. Uh, go ahead and turn my video back on and just ask, uh, I noticed there's a few people joined us today. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to post those in Q and A or into the chat and I'd be happy to um, address those questions for you. Otherwise, um, like I say, do feel free to reach out to me, taylor at flojo.com. Um, if you'd like to set up a one-on-one -on -one demo, I'd be more than happy to do that. Or just answer any questions you have about merging your data, uh, flow data with single cell RNA sequencing and performing the analysis therein. You can see that in the background here, I've got a couple of analyses open, but the one I draw your attention to is this uh, AMP lupus demo which is, of course, the data that we've been speaking, uh, speaking to all, all this session, um, where I've developed a number of gene sets. Um, I've done some deeper analysis into uh, B cells and also the rest of the subsets available there. Uh, if we open up the layout editor, we can kind of scroll through quickly here. Um, I think there's a couple of blank slides but I would like to show my cell calling potentially. Let's see if that'll pop open. There we go. And of course, within the layouts, we can uh, change any of the different coloring used here. Maybe we want a yellow. Actually, I think I like that previous color. All right. Well, it seems like I'm not getting any questions, but um, um, maybe you guys are all still pondering this or signing up for a trial currently. Um, I hope that's the case. Uh, but please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or concerns. Um, again, my email is taylor at flojo.com. And thanks so much for joining. Bye now.